Hello folks, it's Professor Watts again, and we're moving on today to talk about market competition. We're building on what we, we were just talking about in lecture 13 about the market being a process and how when we have equilibrium prices and uh, profit-seeking entrepreneurship, what emerges from the competitive pursuit of profits is uh, economic prosperity, where uh, profit-making firms are creating value for consumers, they grow and expand, they continue to be able to access resources and loss-making firms that are not creating value for consumers, they kind of fall by the wayside, they go bankrupt, they go out of business. And what we get as a result of that is, is consistent growth and value of what the economy produces. And in order for entrepreneurs to try to maintain profits or acquire profits, they have to be innovative. They have to either come up with better products and services and or come up with more efficient ways of making those products and services. So competition is really at the heart of that process and at the beneficial societal results we get from that process in terms of kind of the rising prosperity and rising standard of living that we're accustomed to in the free market type of economy that we live in. So what we want to do in this lecture is kind of delve a little bit deeper into this idea of market competition. We want to uh, dispel a few false ideas about competition in the market and to really just take a look at some examples of what this competitive process has wrought for us over the long run. And there's some fun ways to think about that in terms of uh, imitation and then in terms of the effect on price and cost of production for goods. And when we take the long view, when we look back over, you know, say a hundred years or so, what, we'll, what we will see is that uh, the real prices and the real costs for pretty much all consumer goods. So the kind of stuff we buy on, on a daily basis, our daily bread, remember, the, those prices have really just fallen, fallen, and fallen, which means we can buy more, we have more abundance, more prosperity. Okay, so I wanna start off by trying some metaphors on you. I think it's useful to, to think figuratively. So think about how the competitive market process works. One is a garden. And I want you to imagine a very well-maintained garden, well-watered, good soil, and it's producing a lot of abundant plants for us. You think about the market process as a garden full of plants that try to grow, and only those plants that create value are allowed to remain, and the plants that don't create value, the weeds, are pulled. Basically what the market process does is water the good plants, those companies that are, that are fruitful and producing value for people, and it, it pulls or cuts down the weeds, so the, the plants that, that try that start off and they look green and they look p like they have potential that turn out to not produce fruit for anyone well they get cut down what we're going to wind up with is a continual increase of good fruit a growing amount of wealth another metaphor that i think may be apt in describing the competitive market process in the business world is that of uh, gladiatorial combat and this was depicted uh, quite vividly in the russell crowe movie the gladiator are you not entertained are you not entertained? And Maximus the Gladiator asks the crowd, are you not entertained? Well, I might say the gladiators of the business arena, who are, who are really in a, in a life and death struggle. Now, of course, the people don't die here, but businesses do. We usually don't wind up with one dominant firm, but we might wind up with a handful of dominant firms. But there's always a struggle. There's always new people entering the arena to challenge the, the current champions, if you will. But this is like a gladiatorial combat in the sense that whereas the businesses and the entrepreneurs are out there fighting to, to the business death in the arena, all of the consumers up in the, the stands, so to speak, are entertained. Well, maybe not entertained, but better housed, fed, clothed, educated, etc. due to market competition because we have more and more of basically all products and services at lower real prices with a few exceptions due to having a flourishing competitive market process. We live better than we ever have in pretty much in world history because we have a market system that is very good at getting people to generate value for each other through the competitive quest for profits. Okay, now we have to be a little careful with uh, using metaphors, especially a, a kind of a sports or combat type metaphor when talking about the market because we're dealing with fundamentally different kinds of competition. So the metaphor only goes so far. So we need to distinguish between the kind of competition that occurs in, in, in a market-based economic process versus the combative type competition that occurs in often in nature or in, in combat or in sports and things like that. So, so that second kind of competition is has been labeled biological competition by the economists. And here we're talking about a literal fight for survival, you know, animals fighting each other for food out in the jungle. 
or gladiators in an arena, armies fighting a war. It's a zero-sum game, and we've talked about this before in class, I believe, you know, the, the difference between a positive sum and zero sum and negative sum game. In a positive sum game, like trade, both parties benefit. You know, I trade you, we both get we both kind of give up something we value less in exchange for something we value more. That's win-win. Competitive economic system is based on trade, comparative advantage, specialization, and trade. So economics is of course a positive sum game. And this kind of competition is zero sum. It's it's an ecological type competition. You you see it a lot in nature. And here's an example. The competition between animals is pretty brutal, it's pretty nasty, and there's one winner and one loser in, in this scene. You can guess what's going to happen next. Okay, so that's biological competition, and that's not really an apt description of what's happening in the competitive business world, even though you might have one company sort of, quote, eating another company or destroying another company. Nobody dies here, nobody really gets physically harmed. Okay, people just lose their jobs and businesses close down and then people can move on and do different things. And oftentimes, you know, that's a source of growth for us. You, you move on from one job, from one company that fails to another one. That's a positive step, a positive opportunity. You actually often wind up with a higher income because that's the economic process sorting us out and, and kind of pushing us into those things in which we create the most value for others. So that brings us to this idea of catalactic competition. And this is a fancy sounding word, I know, but it stems from a Greek word that talks about turning enemy into friend, catalaxis. And this is what happens in exchange. So instead of fighting each other and trying to knock each other on the head and steal each other's stuff, we can work out a deal. Say, hey, I'll specialize in this trade, you specialize in that trade, and then at the end of the day, we'll get together and trade off our surplus production and we'll both have more, right? Remember my motto in specialization plus trade, everybody has more of everything. That is catalaxy or catalactic competition rather than biological competition. In biological competition, you know, we might say, biological competition, we might say some have more, others die. Catalaxy refers to an effort to win people over. So it's a mutually beneficial concept here. Positive sum game where gains for one don't rule out gains for another. We can all have more of everything. And here's an example that we've talked about the battle between Netflix and Blockbuster, right? Netflix killed Blockbuster, well, killed the business, but no, people weren't really harmed here. In fact, I bet even people who used to work at Blockbuster are pretty happy on the whole. They probably easily found new jobs working in other retail outlets, but now they have the benefits of the kind of services that Netflix and other competitors provide. That's the kind of catalactic competition that we're talking about here in the competitive market process. Okay, so we understand the, the, the distinct nature of the competition. Now we want to look at some of the results. And the, the neatest thing, I think, is to look at the, a very long run trend of what happens to prices and costs of goods. We talked about this a little bit in the context of the bread factory, where we thought about if it's a competitive process. Remember at the beginning of that, I was making huge profits that would surely attract competition. And then how would competitors compete for market share? Well, they would start cutting the price and then I would have to respond by cutting my price. Eventually, we get to the point where profits have been competed away. Then I say, I want my profits back. So what am I forced to do? I'm forced to come up with a more efficient way of producing the product so I can lower the costs. And then that price cutting process starts all over. Well, imagine what that does over about a hundred year span of time. And fortunately, we have some nice data on this. Now, this report is a little dated. It's, a, it's going on 20 years old now, and I'd like to have this updated this. But nonetheless, this uh, 1997 report here from the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas about the declining real cost of living is pretty illustrative for us. And what they do here is they consider the cost of basic products in terms of the work required to earn the money to buy them at the average wage. So this makes it kind of commensurable from a long ago time period up till a more recent time period. So let's look at uh, one of their main examples, our daily bread, one of our themes in the class. And what they're doing here is saying at, at the average wage at the time in 1919 and then in 1997, how much minutes of work would it take to earn the money to buy these items? Okay, so this is what we call the work cost. And this is a good way to compare this on a kind of apples to apples basis because we know the value of money is declining over time due to inflation. That's something you'll learn about in more detail if you take macro with me. Okay, so look what's happened. In, the, in 1919, it took 101 minutes worth of work at average wages to earn three pounds of tomatoes. 
And then in 97, it only took 18 minutes. Eggs, 80 minutes, down to 5. Sugar, 72 minutes, down to 10. Bacon, 70 down to 12. Okay, look at all of these are falling off dramatically. What's happening here is that farmers and food producers are getting really, really efficient at both growing the crops and then processing the food, packaging the food. Transportation networks are improving. The cost of, at every stage of production from the farm to the grocery store is falling. And because of competition, that means the price falls right with the cost. So what we predicted in the bread factory is actually the truth of what we observe over long periods of time in the market process. And, and if this trend held up from 1919 to 1997, you know, we've had further technological innovation since 97. The internet has really come into its own and communication technology has improved. So what would you guess has continued to happen to the real cost in terms of the work time required to earn these items? Well, sure, it's, it continues to fall. Here's another way of looking at it. Here, this shows the, uh, the, both the nominal price, so the dollar price people pay for a three pound chicken, and that's the, that's the red line here. And this goes back to 1919. You see that went down during the Great Depression years. That was a, a tremendous deflation. That was actually bad for the economy. And it went up in the World War II inflation. And then in the uh, past several decades, that nominal price has been rising pretty steadily. But remember, that's all inflation. In terms of the work time cost, which is over here on this axis, we can see that it has pretty much been steadily falling it's pretty much bottomed out at very low levels. You know, it only takes 10, 15 minutes of work time in 1997 to buy a whole chicken. That's pretty darn impressive. You know, we eat really well because food is really cheap and food is really cheap because our competitive market process is so good at producing things in abundance because of that competitive pressure that's always out there. Okay, let's look at maybe one more example from this report. I'll, I'll post this on the, uh, on the Blackboard course site for you so you can take a look yourself. Uh, look at the appliances. Uh, a range in 1910 cost 345 hours worth of work at the average wage. In 1997, that was down to $288, which is just 22 hours worth of work. You know, le less than a tenth of the work hours required to acquire a much better product, too. Uh, you know, your 1910 range would probably have been a coal or wood fired. You had to light it yourself. It's sooty, it's a mess, it's smoky. And your 1997 range would be a nice electric or gas model, really clean, burning, really efficient. Same story for your dishwasher. It goes from a whopping 463 hours of work at average 1913 wages down to 28 hours. You know, less than a week's worth of work, you can acquire a dishwasher. And by the way, this is that, that early dishwasher was this thing right here. Kind of primitive, not too effective compared to the ones you can get nowadays You know, at, at Lowe's or Home Depot. They're really efficient. They, they work amazingly well. The detergents are better. They have multiple uh, spray jets on them. They just keep getting better and cheaper. It's amazing. Refrigerator, first electric refrigerator in 1916 cost 3,000 hours of work time. In 1997 here, it's, it's, we see it only costs $900 or 68 hours. I just bought one in the summer of 2016 for a uh, rental property I own. And I think I, I wanna say I paid about four, four or $500 just a basic uh, top and bottom refrigerator freezer, but you know, really, really quality, really reliable, for four hundred dollars, and and that's in twenty sixteen dollars. So that that trend is continuing. The, the real cost of this stuff just keeps on going down. We just have this tremendous abundance being created in pretty much all products, all goods and services because of the competitive process. Similar pattern here for the clothes washer. 500 hours down to 26 hours. So this story is repeated again and again and again, pretty much you name a product, we can see that the real price of it, the cost in terms of average work time is just going down, down, down. Okay, so, so our predictions that we made in our mapping out our market process theory are, and what, you know, thinking about how the competitive process would work in the, in the bread factory and that kind of thing, that's really panning out in this actual data. Okay, so another way to think about the uh, long run results of this competitive market process at work is a process that I refer to as imitation, replication, and price minimization. You see this when you go to the grocery store. My favorite is the breakfast cereals aisle because here's a case in point. We've got Kellogg's Original Frosted Flakes, but you go in any grocery store and you're going to see a lot of knockoff competitors. Here's uh, Aldi stores, which is extremely low price. Basically the exact same product. You know, the difference is they've got a polar bear on the box instead of a tiger. I found this one online. Here's the uh, here's the lion frosted flakes and uh, somebody slapped a motto on there. 
instead of they're great, they're acceptable. Well, sure, you know, it's, a, it's not too challenging for other companies to closely replicate that product. And you see, we could go on and on the different uh, knockoff products that are pretty close copies of the original. And of course, they're offered at lower prices. Crisp 6 here costs uh, considerably less than Crisp X, and that's competitive pressure that's going to keep the price of Crisp X down and offer a lot of abundance of very similar products to a large uh, body of consumers. We could probably spend hours just looking at that kind of competition and replication and imitation in breakfast cereals alone. And of course that occurs everywhere else. Everything you buy in the grocery store to uh, you know cars, computers, cell phones, smartphones. Every company is trying to replicate the best features of what the other companies are doing. And they compete, as we know, by trying to offer lower prices. And here's kind of some evidence of that, uh, the price competition. Lots of stores you'll see offer these price match guarantees. So here's Best Buy, I found this on their website. They say, we won't be beat on price. We'll match the product prices of key online and local competitors. You show them an advertisement from a competitor offering a certain price, and they say, we'll honor that. Okay, so price competition at work. Toys R Us, okay, Bed Bath & Beyond. All kinds of companies do this. The fact that companies are pretty explicit about the idea that they're not going to be undersold by competitors well, that, that can only mean one thing, that there's a strong downward price tendency across all these businesses. Okay, so we see the results of competition at work. Continual innovation, quality and variety of products, continual downward pressure on costs and prices, and that really means one thing, more abundance of everything for all consumers, and that's all of us. So the competitive aspects of this process, again, is the central thing. It's the thing that's making it work for the benefit of all.